our starting place this evening. I'll tell you something I don't recommend, but well, I'll tell you, it's just as, as fun as anything you'll ever do in your life. You ever see these people going down the river in a, in a raft or on an inner tube or something like that? If you just get in that river and just lay on your back and get your feet out in front of you and just take off down that river, I tell you, there's no, there's no, there's no thrill like it. It's just, it's just fun. It's just a lot of fun. It can be painful, but it's, but it's a lot of fun, a whole lot of fun. And uh, I just only had one little problem. I got turned around one time, and you, as long as your feet are out front, you can kind of protect yourself. But you get flipped around and your face is out front, <laughs> you get really hurt. God's good. I, I caught this the, the boulder right here. And I, you know, two inches over here, two inches over here, I'm, I'm really hurting. But as it is, I'm just, just a little sore, nothing, nothing Royce needed to fix. So, praise the Lord. But what's that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. It doesn't bruise as easy as some of the other parts. That's for sure. But, uh, but God's, God's good. He's really good to us. And we got to uh, witness to a girl named... Uh, uh, Vola from Belarus, and I tell you what, if I was, I'd just interested in just going somewhere for a week and and doing mission work. Um, I'd go up there to uh, Pigeon Forge in Gatlinburg and just give out gospel tracts. So just a zillion people there from all over the world, blowing money, trying to have a little fun, and just walking up and down those sidewalks looking for looking for something to do, and. Uh, that's the only reason I'd go there. I, I wouldn't go to. I wouldn't want to go to Gatlinburg. I wouldn't want to drive through it. I said, just had. It's amazing how you can take a place so beautiful and make it so ugly. But boy, they sure did it in that in that place. If you spent your honeymoon there, I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> not trying to hurt your feelings or anything. It's just I can't imagine going on a vacation and being where people just shoulder to shoulder. Uh, with Burger King in one hand and a, and a raffle ticket in the other and waiting for the country and western review to open and just <laughs> I'm telling you just everywhere and you get up there in that Pigeon Forge I'm telling you there's people there from all over the world it just we, we went in this restaurant to eat and it was like uh, you know going on some Disney ride and they just it, they just had somebody there from every country and shape and color and size and just be a great place to go and, and witness, tell people about Jesus. And, and uh, uh, for the foreigners, anyway, all the Americans up there are saved already. They're all, they're all saved. It's like, like Florida. So, All right, Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 7. No, we didn't send the boys down that river. I know that's what you scared to death. But we, didn't, we didn't send the boys down. They, they watched. But that cliff jumping fun. And if you're ever on a trip and you've got to pick a roommate, don't pick Stevan. I've been with people talking their sleep, but that boy hollers in his sleep. He, just, he does, I'm telling you. Just, he says he doesn't. They tried to tell me one night it was just me dreaming it wasn't him. But I was awake the next night when he started, so I know it, I know it was him. So. It's amazing. All right, Joshua 1, verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou should have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals. For within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan, to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Father, we ask that you'd bless your word to our hearts tonight. 
Lord, we pray for our, uh, our sister, uh, Barbara Garden, her daughter, and God, so many like her, some uh, even among us, Lord, that so desperately need Your Word to guide and direct them. Lord, we ask and pray for her and for others like her. Lord, that they would surrender their self-will and their opinion to the authority of Your Word. That You might cause them to prosper and enjoy life more abundant. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. God calls here, as we saw this morning, upon Joshua and the people that are with him to observe his word to do it. And without that observance, without that obedience, there'll be no prosperity, there'll be no success, there'll be no enjoyment of the promised blessings. And we covered this morning, with the help of God, the difference between being saved and being spiritually minded. And there is a great difference. There are saved people who aren't here tonight for no good reason at all other than they just didn't want to be with God's people and hear God's Word and sing God's praise and they're saved. But not interested. There are saved people tonight justifying all manner of sin and transgression and many of them doing so by giving God the credit for their disobedience. It's important that we love the Lord. Not enough of that in our Baptist churches. We claim to love the Bible. The Bible. I believe the Bible. I go by the Bible. You seldom hear the name of Jesus. A lot about King James, but not much about King Jesus. Then on the other hand, you have, I love the Lord, therefore... Now watch, here's how it goes. I love the Lord. I want to live for the Lord. In fact, I love the Lord so much that whatever I'm doing must be of the Lord because I love Him. Did you pray about it? Yes, I did. And what was the answer? Well, I have peace about it. Well, you know something? If you're self-righteous, you can have peace about anything. If I convince myself that God is speaking to me, And if I convince myself that because my intentions and my motives are true, that I couldn't possibly go wrong, I could shoot you and have peace about it. I could pray about it and have peace about it. And really believe that because I'm so spiritual and I love God so much, that what I'm doing is God's will. I've I've seen people blow up their automobile because God told them not to fix this or change the oil or repair that. God gave me peace about it. Well, I hope He gives you peace about walking because you ain't got no car. (laughs) God can give you peace about anything if you're convinced that your thought life and your imagination is God's voice. God told me. Now, look, I, I'm not being critical here. I'm really not. Even though it's, I'm sure it sounds like I am, I'm not being critical. There is nothing more prideful and self-righteous than someone saying, I don't need to consult the Bible. God told me. So, you, like the Pope, are seated on this ultra-high spiritual plane where you have this special communion with God that none of the rest of us are entitled to. We're all just stuck with His Word. 
you get extra revelations that aren't in the Bible. And let me tell you something. If you're convinced that your feelings take precedent over God's words, there's nobody on the face of the earth that can talk you out of ruining your spiritual life or your temporal life and giving God the credit for it. That's why the Lord said, I want you to observe to do according to what I wrote in a book. And I want you to meditate day and night in this book. And I want you to make certain you're not turning aside to the right hand or turning aside to the left hand from this book because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? That is, I, I despair of the wickedness I find in my own heart. So that's Old Testament Scripture. All right, how about one from the New? The Apostle Paul said, O wretched man that I am! When I would do good, I find that evil is present with me. And when I seek to be right, something inside me is trying to convince me to do wrong. He said it this way in, a, in another passage. We are of those that put no confidence in the flesh. Now let me help you with this matter of meditating on the Word. Here's how it goes in, in, in our modern world, in the charismatic world, in the in the uh, touchy-feely emotional world of, of present-day religion. I read a verse of Scripture, and then I take that verse of Scripture over here, and I meditate on it. I think about it. I evaluate it. I line it up with or without my circumstances, and then I get a feeling based on my meditation regarding that verse. Well, I may be meditating upon the Word, but God didn't say meditate. He said meditate therein. Don't take the verse out of the book to meditate on it. Take the book, uh, take the verse through the book to meditate on it. I mentioned this morning the passage where Jesus turned the water into wine. I can pull that passage aside and think about it and talk about it and discuss it and come to my conclusion of the passage or I can take that passage to every other reference to wine and strong drink in the Bible and from a biblical meditation come to a biblical conclusion. So God didn't say meditate on the Word. He said meditate in the Word. Take a verse, compare it to another verse, compare those two to another verse, compare those three to yet another verse, and if you find a place where your idea doesn't match the Scripture, you've got a wrong idea. Even if you have peace about it. I don't read in my Bible that uh, Peter was troubled at all the first time he denied the Lord. So, well, you know, if I, I just believe if I'm doing something wrong that God will really convict me about it and I'll just feel awful inside. And Well, Peter's still standing right there by that fire. And the second time he denied the Lord, there's not any suggestion at all in Scripture that Peter had any conscience about it whatsoever. Come on, haven't, haven't every one of us at some time or another just taken a hot iron to our conscience and seared it and convinced ourselves that this would be wrong for everybody else to do, but I can do it and be right because I love the Lord. And God understands. 
and what, whatever, whatever else you know, we, we picked up from Robert Schuller and, and the rest of that crowd. I can feel good about doing wrong. I have all my life. I can feel justified in disobedience. I have all my life. So I not only have to have God's Word, I have to stay in God's Word, and my thoughts regarding God's Word have to be within the confines of God's Word. Now, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just get up tomorrow morning and, and get you some, some antacid, and turn on WYND. If you're going to need something, some Pepto-Bismol or something, and just turn on, turn on that Christian radio station and listen to one man and one woman after another take the Bible and read a verse out of the Bible and then pervert it beyond recognition. You can do it. How many times have you heard a sermon in your life on John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, therefore we should tithe? I mean, come on! You got a verse, and then you took it out of the Bible, and you thought about it, and you prayed about it, and you outlined it, and you looked up illustrations for it, and you preached it, and you went home and your wife said, Honey, that was a great sermon on giving. Yeah, but you perverted the Word of God to do it. And had perfect peace about it. The fact that you got peace simply means that you love yourself. The fact that I, I don't feel convicted just proves that I'm way out there. I need to get in this book and stay in this book and not only examine my thoughts by the book, but examine my thoughts about the book by the book. I can teach some amazing things with this Bible. I heard an independent, fundamental, King James only, premillennial. Baptist preacher preach at a camp meeting that the kings of Israel were the typology for the pastor of the New Testament church. Therefore, if David wanted another man's wife, nobody had any right to say anything about it. You know, that's, that's just about as wicked as anything being discussed in that bar on the side of the fence. And, and you know, you know what, he was, what he was using to teach it? He was using the Bible. And I'm sure he'd thought about it. I'm sure he'd prayed about it. I'm sure he had meditated upon the message and convinced himself that he was right. And that's why when you try to witness to people, say, oh, that Bible, you can make that Bible mean anything you want it to, and you can. You can make that Bible say anything you want to say, and you can. And you can find a verse in the Bible to back up anything you want to do. Or you can take that verse and see how it lines up with all the other verses and meditate not on a Scripture, but in the Scripture. And that's the only safe rule. I've, I have commanded you. So command, verse 9. To be strong. It's a command, verse 7, be strong and very courageous. But verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do, now look, to do according to all that is written therein. You see that? If my use of a verse is not in accord with the whole. I'm misusing the verse. You see, you see how that's laid out? I want you to take my word, I want you to meditate on my word, so that what you do matches the whole and the totality of what I have revealed. Why are people arguing about whether or not homosexuality is right? Why are churches arguing about whether or not to ordain women? 
Why are Christians arguing about uh, issues pertaining to divorce and remarriage? Why All of these things because somebody has a verse. But they are using that verse outside the scope of the, of the total revelation of God in the Bible. Well, doesn't the Bible say we're supposed to love? Yes, it does. Now, let's find out who we're supposed to love, how we're supposed to love them, under what conditions we're supposed to love them, within what limits and boundaries we're supposed to love them. Don't just quote me a verse. How does the verse relate to the whole? Scripture. Judas went out and hanged himself. Scripture. Go thou and do likewise. Scripture. That thou doest, do quickly. Scripture, the Lord be with thee. Look, it's all Bible. But you can't just pull something out of God's Word to support what you've already decided you want to do. I don't want to go to church. Here's a verse. I don't want to witness. Here's a verse. I don't want to reconcile with my wife. Here's a verse. I don't want to forgive that brother. Here's a verse. I want to stay mad. Here's a verse. Anybody can find a verse. How will I know she's the right girl for my son? Well, if she draws water from the well and gives it to my camels... Till then, she ain't going anywhere. Why, you're crazy. The Bible says your daughter's supposed to go to a guy's house and lay down at the foot of his bed till morning. The Bible worked for Ruth. Now, honey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it the Bible way. You go over to Joe Bob's house. And you... in the Bible. You've got to take the whole Scripture and allow the Scripture within the context of the Scripture to direct you in most cases contrary to what you want to do. Because what you and I want to do is, is rarely a revelation from on high. It's usually just the course of nature And so a constant dwelling upon the Word of God day and night, night and day is necessary to keep me from turning aside to the right hand or turning aside to the left hand. I need it. Now I'm going to tell you another way this factors in. Not only do I need the Scripture to keep me from doing wrong, I need the Scripture to provoke me to do right. There are situations I'd rather not deal with. There are things that come up in, in, in relationships and in a church and, and in dealing with the world that you'd just like to say a prayer and turn it over to God and not deal with it. The Bible doesn't allow for that. Well, I could find a verse. Let the dead bury the dead. They're lost. Who cares? I could find a verse, God's chosen from the foundation of the world. (laughs) See, I don't have to witness. I mean, there's a verse to help you feel comfortable not doing what you're supposed to do, but the totality of the Scripture will not support such ideas. So I, I like wall calendars with a nice Bible verse and a thought for the day. But you can't have a wall calendar Christianity. A verse for the day may be the middle of a sentence. And the verse on either side may be the key to the verse on your calendar. I had a lady, I, I know I've, I've used this example before, but I, I sat in the home of a, of a lady over in, in New Smyrna Beach, and she told me that she was praying in tongues and the Holy Spirit directed her to divorce her husband and move in with another man. 
So I can't believe that. You know why you can't believe that? Because you're trying to obey the Scripture. You know the Scripture forbids that. But if the final authority in your life is not the Scripture, it's God speaking to you. God always says what you want Him to. That's the thing about the Bible. I can't just think the thoughts I want to think and then sign them with God's name. Well, you know, the Bible says, whatsoever you ask in faith, believing, so that's just like going down to the store with a check that has God's signature on it. You're crazy. God is not going to bless the lust of your flesh. The Holy Spirit wasn't given you to gratify your sensual desires. And the fact that you feel right about it or have peace about it just shows the grip your old man still has on you. He's convinced you he's God. That's why you've got to have a book. Peter wrote, he said, We were on the Mount of Transfiguration and heard the voice of Almighty God from heaven. But we have a more sure word of prophecy and then made reference to the written Scripture. He said, if I, if I was standing in that parking lot out there and God Himself appeared and spoke to me audibly, I'd check what I heard by the Bible. Because I can be more sure of the Bible than I could that I might have misunderstood Him. I might not remember just exactly what he said. So you can't, couldn't have an experience like that and, and never forget it. Really? You mean like Elijah slaying the prophets of Baal in chapter 18 and hiding in the cave in chapter 19? You mean like Peter walking on the water and then saying, I never knew him? You mean like going to the tomb and finding it empty? And having the Lord walk through the wall of the upper room and seeing the print of the nails in His hands and the, and the hole in His side and then getting naked and going fishing? Come on. You can't trust yourself. I can't trust myself. i got to stay in this book. It's the only sure guide. It's the only safe rule. Now, there's three things that ought to affect our lives. And we need all three. All three of these things are to have an effect upon me. Learning facts about the Bible doesn't necessarily affect your life. Okay, let's take a look at what they are. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I need all three of these things to be effected, moved, changed, altered, redirected. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. Now watch. The word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If I... Now now listen. He didn't say if I have the Word of God. He didn't say if I read the Word of God. He didn't say if I learn the Word of God. He said if I will believe the Word of God, the Word of God will have an effect upon my life. If you're not loving your wife like Christ loved the church, you're not a Bible believer. Because if you believe the Bible, it would affect your life. If you're not witnessing faithfully to the lost, you're not a Bible believer. If you believed the Bible, it would affect your life. If you don't love the brethren, if you love yourself, you're not a Bible believer... You may have the right version of the Bible, but if I believe the Bible, it's going to move me. It's going to change me. It's going to alter me. 
God's Word works effectually in them that believe. That's why when Joshua is getting ready to go into the land, here they are. And, and the Lord said, I'll tell you what you better do. Better make sure you got enough to eat. Better make sure everybody's fed. I want you to get some, some men in leadership positions, and I want those men to make sure everybody's well fed. We're going to have to, we got some battles up here. The Lord's going to fight our battles for us. The Lord's going to give us victory, but we need to be well fed. You know what Jesus called the ministry of the Word? He called it meat to eat. You know what the Word of God is called? It's called bread. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. So you know what we need? <laughs> we need men in leadership positions, not slapping us in the forehead, not waving their coat at us, not blowing on us, feeding us. We can't win spiritual battles on sideshow performances. We need food. Feed me. God's Word's the only thing going to change me. It has an effect upon those that believe. People went to church this morning. You know what they got? Theatrics. They went to church this morning. You know what they got? Choreographed dancing. They went to church this morning. You know what they got? They got a rock concert. They went to church this morning. You know what they got? They got a, uh, a fashion show. They went to church this morning. You know what they got? Philosophy. They went to church this morning. You know what they got? They got Oprah in a robe. And you wonder why they walk out no different than they were when they went in. What effect is the preaching of a church that supports homosexuality? What effect is that going to have on your life for God? None. Don't believe the Bible. Don't believe the bodily resurrection. Don't believe the virgin birth. Half the preachers on the denominational payroll don't believe Jesus Christ was God. And you think that's going to change anybody's life just because they went to church? It takes God's Word to have an effect on people. You go downtown Friday afternoon. Just go downtown. Just hold a sign. I'm a Baptist. I'm not going to affect anybody. I'm a Catholic. I'm Episcopalian. I'm Presbyterian. Who cares? You go down there and hold a sign and say, Only Jesus saved. Jesus the way, the truth, and the life. You lift up your voice and say, No way to heaven but Jesus. You're going to have an effect on your community. Word of God affects things. Moves things accomplishes things. Secondly, James chapter 5. God's Word will have an effect upon your life. James chapter 5, verse number 16. James five sixteen. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another that you may be healed. <laughs> That's an amazing verse. Come on, take prayer requests in, in just any church. Just go in on a Sunday night, Wednesday night, take prayer requests. You'll have 40 people asked to be healed of some physical ailment before anybody opens their mouth and asks to be healed of a spiritual defect or problem in their life. Why? We're carnally minded. We're not spiritually minded. So you got your liver trouble taken care of. So you got your backache taken care of. So the drainage in your ear got healed up. And you still don't pay your bills. And you're still not submissive to your husband. So what? So you feel good while you're sinning? <laughs> Bible says, how about we pray about these things? How about we got as serious about praying about our spiritual condition as we do about our physical condition? And the Bible says the effectual, now look, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Fervent prayer will have an effect upon your life. You believe that? The Bible says, fervent prayer have an effect on your life. Now, the Word of God 
without the prayer is limited. The prayer without the Word of God is limited. So God said, said two things here. You need my Word. My Word change your life. My Word will affect your life. Prayer, you need prayer. Prayer will change your life. Prayer will affect your life. But if you're praying without the Word, you can pray yourself right off the path. And if you're studying the Bible without prayer, you can study yourself right off the path. The, the, the two men, th- 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 I'd say the three men that have contributed the most factual information to my knowledge of the Word of God were Bullinger, Pink, and Dake. And all three of those guys got so fouled up on their doctrine that you can't with a clear conscience give their writings to anybody that you don't know isn't doubly rooted and grounded in the Word. Right. Word of God affects your life. But, but you, you better be prayerfully in fellowship with the Lord. Just, just study. Isn't going to do it. And just... Prayer isn't going to do it. The two need to balance one another out. And then there's a third. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So, The Lord Jesus Christ gave gifts to members of His body. That's the context of the remarks. Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Okay? So you know what the Bible says? None of us is yet perfected. Okay? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, all of us still need some work. (laughs) For the edifying of the body of Christ, till, till, so we're not there yet, we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man with the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Now look, that's doctrine. You're studying, you're teaching, you're hearing, you're learning, but you're getting off the track. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so here's what happens. And look, you, you've got to be humble or you can't get in the Canaan. You can't be proud and be spiritually minded. Here's, here's how it works. Jim loves the Word of God. And he has dug and studied and searched the Scripture, and he has come to the conclusion. He's come to the conclusion that only those who wear shoes without laces are going to be raptured before the tribulation and everybody else is going through. And he's got verses to prove it. And he loves the Bible and he loves God. He didn't get that from TV. He got that study in the Bible. Okay? Now, Chris, Chris not much on the Bible, but he really loves the Lord. And he's been praying 10, 12, 15 hours a day. And in his prayer time... God spoke to his heart and said the Lord was going to reveal a new truth to him. And so Chris meets Jim at church, and Jim says, Hey, Chris, let me show you something I found in the Bible. And man, they're all excited. And isn't it great that somebody's been praying, they're excited about hearing from God, and somebody's been studying the Bible, and they're excited about learning something new? But then the body of Christ... The, the body of believers with whom Jim and Chris fellowship say, Brother, look, <laughs> I mean, I love you, man. That's, those verses are really interesting, but let me show you the other five about shoelaces. Because I really don't, I, I just, uh, Brother, look, let me just show you. 
Now, you know what? If Jim's proud and self-righteous, he bows up and gets offended because we weren't excited about his new shoelace doctrine. But if he loves the Lord, he says, man, thank God for the effectual working of the body in my life. Thank God for the ministry of my brothers and sisters to keep me in my emotion, in my enthusiasm, in my imperfection from getting off track while I'm studying the Bible. And... and we say, Chris, God bless your heart. The, the, Lord's, the Lord is revealing new truth to you today. And the new truth is the shoelace rapture doctrine isn't right. Just, well, praise the Lord. I, you know, I'm, what, you know I, I just want to go by the Bible and I, you know, thanks guys, I appreciate it. But you know something? Here's what's sad. Living rooms tonight are filled with men who love the Bible. And they're filled with men who love to pray. But they're so proud and so self-righteous that they refuse to be affected by the fellowship of the saints. Nobody's telling me I'm right. Nobody's correcting me. I'm right. Nobody's changing what I believe. I'm right. And the Bible says none of us are. Because none of us is yet perfect in our practice, in our doctrine, in our praying. We all need to be effecting one another. A little bit here, a little bit there. Chip, chip here, chip, chip there. little light here. Little rebuke here, little edification here, little encouragement here, and year after year after year after year, together we improve one another's walk with the Lord. We affect each other. We are zealously affected in a good thing through our fellowship one with another. You ought to see the revelations I get in the mail. Brother James, I know you really love the Bible and I, and I know you study the Word a lot. Let me show you something God showed me. And it's just some off-the-wall, harebrained, crazy thing from somebody that loves God. They're not watching TV. They're not reading romance novels. They're up all night studying their Bible. They're just wrong. And you write back and you say, Brother, you know, that's really interesting. I read it. I enjoyed it. But let me show you these couple of scriptures over here that, that cause that theory to break down. And you get one of two responses. You get, Thank you, brother. I hadn't thought about that. Or you get, You dog-faced hound. You're not a real Bible believer. You stupid idiot. You know what you got? You got somebody affected by the Word, but not affected by the brethren. And you'll get off track on the right hand or the left if you don't have all three. Here comes the phone call. Here comes the letter. Brother James, I've been praying about something. I really believe God wants me, and they do. They really believe God wants them to do this or that based upon their time in prayer. And then you say, well, here's what the Bible says. What did your pastor say? What do your brothers and sisters in Christ say? Well, you know, they're all kind of compromisers. No, they're not. Everybody that disagrees with you is not a compromiser. Everybody that sees something you don't see is not trying to hinder you. They might just be trying to keep you from breaking your neck the way they broke theirs. So the Lord, He's got three things laid out there. I want my word to be your study and your meditation. It will affect your life. And I want fervent prayer to be your practice. It will affect your life. And I want the constant fellowship of the saints to be your, your practice and your method of living because it will affect your life and those three will serve as a check and a balance against one another to keep you from straying into an extreme. You can get into extremes with the Bible and no prayer and no fellowship. You can get into extremes with prayer but no Bible and no fellowship. You get extremes with fellowship but no Bible and no prayer. But you get all three working in your life. God will help you.
God will move you. God will, but you, you and I have got to, I've got to be humble enough for Lou to be able to come and say, Brother, that was a great sermon, but this scripture here seems to contradict what you said. And, I, and I've got to be confident enough in, in my relationships with my brothers and sisters in the Lord to say, Man, thanks, I'm going to look at that. Because all of us, James 5, are faulty. All of us, Ephesians 4, are imperfect. All of us, 1 Thessalonians 2, need instructing. So what if we just checked our pride at the door and said, Lord, I'm coming in here to be affected. I'm going to church today to be affected. I'm going to prayer meeting to be affected. I'm going to go into Bible study to be affected. God, I want your word or prayer or the brethren to change me a little bit today for the better. And God will do it. He won't do it overnight. He won't do it with one trip to the altar. He won't do it in one special prayer that you pray. But little by little, day by day, year after year, He will bring us into victory and into the spiritual life. That's what He wants to do. Well, somebody come to me and say, Brother, brother, listen, I, I I think you're messing up here. I think you're off track. And I, I mean me, you know, I've been saved so long now, know so much about the Bible. I get mad. Or I get my feelings hurt. Or I instantly begin to think of a way to defend myself. And then if God will help me, I'll repent. And try to let the other members of the body minister effectually to this member of the body. So I've learned some things about the Bible in prayer meetings that I didn't learn in Bible studies. And I've learned some things about prayer in Bible study that I didn't learn in a prayer meeting. And I've learned plenty about both from being around the brethren. You get a guy out there all by himself studying the Bible, no checks, no balances, no fellowship, and he's going to find something in there nobody's ever seen before. God didn't even see it. (laughs) Amen. I want to be effective. And I want God to do it in His in His way. So, Sunday school teachers, heads of household, prepare vittles. Feed them. Then pray with them. Then bring them to fellowship. We need all three. Need all three. Father, bless Your Word to our hearts. Make us willing, God to be obedient there